August 1988, a killer stalks the Mourmelon region of France. Eight young men disappear in just eight years. Most are military cadets. Officials dismiss the men as deserters. Family members fight for the real story to be told. I still think we were cheated all along. Cheated of justice, robbed of it. One dogged police officer refuses to let the case go. And I remember very well saying to my captain, let's get our man. A small corner of northern France becomes known as the Triangle of Death. What is happening to the young cadets? Several different theories are uncovered. Different suspects are identified. Tireless detective work. Tiny pieces of dirt and hair lead police to a shocking conclusion. And in the end, the case takes one last startling turn. August 8, 1987. In a quiet patch of countryside near the town of Alencourt, France, farmer Marcel Lant takes his dog for a walk. It's a daily ritual that today will have a grisly ending. The body has no wallet, no money, no clues to his name. Jacques Buxa, head of the violent crime division of the gendarme, is assigned to the case. We found a body with no ID, so we had no idea who he was, where he was from, where he was going. We had nothing. All we knew was that this was a young man whose body showed traces of violence and had been buried in a shallow grave. So this was a murder. The first theory is that this crime is a petty robbery gone wrong. The body quickly buried to hide the evidence. The shallow grave is only five meters from a local road and just off a major French highway, the A26. It is one of the few wooded bits of land in the area. The body is taken to the morgue at the nearby St. Quentin Hospital. We have a young male, Caucasian, in his late teens or early 20s. We can see the presence of some wounds on the posterior of the right ear, indicating the body was likely buried four to five days ago. The body was buried in early August. It's not badly decayed, which helps to discover how the victim died. We can see a horizontal rounded strangulation groove. Less than a centimeter wide. Une trace de strangulation était parfaitement visible. The strangulation marks were perfectly Donc, visible. Euh, it was clearly a violent death. But we still didn't understand why he was killed, or by whom. Immediately, suspicion falls on a gang that is targeting hitchhikers in the north of France. We had information about a gang of thieves, who they were, where they lived. We requested a search warrant, then raided their houses. But we learned quickly that they had nothing to do with the case. The gang members are thieves, but not killers. Their alibis are solid. The investigation moves on. The question is, 
Why are there no signs of struggle? There is no damage to the internal organs, no other marks to the face, no wounds on the head. How could the victim have been killed without fighting back? There is a small bruise, roughly two centimeters wide on the right arm. Strange small wounds on each arm could explain why there were no other injuries on the body. At this point, we realized the victim had bruising on the arms and the wrists, and this bruising would be consistent with being tied up. The marks lead to a second theory. This wasn't an accidental death during a robbery, but a premeditated crime. The victim was bound first, then strangled. L'identification du corps est, est primordiale. Pour travailler sur une personne sans nom, c'est chercher this is like looking for a needle in a haystack. Who was this man? Where was he going? Answers to these questions will help find the killer. Dental records are a vital tool in helping identify unknown victims. In this case, police find one tooth is missing. Another is split in two. None of it was caused during the murder. In the end, a small business card found near the body helps point police in the right direction. It leads them to Aerline O'Keefe in Ireland. My daughter got a telephone call in her work in London to say that um, was her boss missing. It was her boss's business card had been found in France in a field. And the police was checking to see was our boss okay, and she said, yes, he is, he's at a meeting. And uh, they told her a body had been found in France, and her boss's business card was on it, and she said, that's my brother. The body is identified as Trevor O'Keefe, an Irishman who was touring the north of France. He was three months short of his 20th birthday. And we got there half 10 at night, pouring rain, winter time. And we went in and we asked the police to show us the body and we identified who we were by passports and whatever. And they showed us Trevor's um, runners and his watch. And they showed us the photographs where they took Trevor out of the ground by stages. But it was Trevor. O'Keefe was staying with his friends in the city of Poligny. On August 3rd, five days before his body was found, he told his friends he was going to hitchhike to Calais. The route he was going to take would have brought him right by St. Quentin. Buxin quickly develops a dark theory of what happened and calls in some help. Captain Joël Vaillant is the head of the Special Investigations Unit of the Gendarmerie. His mandate is to modernize the techniques of the gendarme the police who patrol the French countryside. L'essentiel, c'est que nous étions à cette époque-là, en 1988, nous étions à ce qu'on appelle le balbutiement de l'ADN. Et que cette technique des États-Unis n'était encore pas très implantée dans l'Europe. Vaillant is investigating another gruesome crime, one startlingly similar to the O'Keefe case. Five years earlier, the body of Olivier Donner was found. He was buried in a wooded area near mailly le camp It's just 130 kilometers from where Trevor O'Keefe is found. Donner had been buried for more than a month when he was found. Decomposition had set in. The head was little more than teeth and bones. On voyait bien que les conditions dans lesquelles it was obvious from Donna's condition how he was found that this could be nothing but a criminal attack. Les larves, les because his head was infested with worms and insects, du, du corps, there had been a lot of blood uh, trapped there. Y a eu un, un, so he died by either sang smothering sang or strangulation. One or the other. Mort était dû par étouffement, so now we have a connection with O'Keefe. It reinforces our belief that O'Keefe's death was a criminal case too. If there is a killer stalking northern France, Vaillant believes it's only a matter of time before he strikes again. September 1987. Weeks pass without another murder. 
but Captain Joël Vaillant fears it is only a matter of time until another body is found buried in the woods of France. Then a killer is caught in Martigny, Switzerland. Michel Piri has kidnapped, raped and murdered four young hitchhikers, including one in southern France. So tell me a bit more about your story, please. Yes. I was looking for attractive people. He's Swiss, but it's just Men a few hundred women. kilometers from the Swiss Especially border to where O'Keefe and Donner were killed. Fayon rushes like to Martigny them. to watch Piri's interrogation. To it's a chilling place. encounter. I was ready every time I picked someone up. If I liked them, I took them to an isolated place and I killed them. How? O'Keefe was buried in a shallow grave. So was Donner. But all of Piri's victims were savagely beaten, then burned. Piri's alibi for early August is also airtight. He's clearly not the killer that Vaillant's looking for. Mm -hmm. What's intriguing is when he's questioned, he's asked, why did you kill your victims? And his answer is, I didn't have any choice. I didn't want to get caught. I didn't want to get caught. And so we were found in the construction intellectual that we were facing a pervert sexual. So faced with his mindset, we're clearly up against a serial killer, a sexual pervert. Based on Piri's logic, our killer has no choice. He has to kill. In one year, we have two murders, Donner and O'Keefe. And after Piri's interrogation, I knew I was dealing with a similar profile. Vaillant is more convinced than ever that the murders of Trevor O'Keefe and Olivier Donner are linked. And he thinks the trail of bodies is even longer. C'est à ce moment-là que je vais apprendre qu'il y a eu antérieurement d'autres disparitions de jeunes gens, mais qui étaient militaires et qui étaient considérés comme des agresseurs. Ce que nous allons faire, I ask that we reopen all of these cases, Je vais demander all of these men we call the disappeared of Mourmelon. Des disparus de Mourmelon, car je n'ai jamais voulu utiliser cette terminologie de désertion, I never car elle a une connotation deserters, administrative because it has an implication, a legal meaning familles, for the families. La désertion, c'est un acte volontaire de vouloir quitter l'armée. Est-ce que Do ils avaient manifesté cette volonté de Are quitter l'armée? De or did they disappear in, in much more sinister circumstances? Dans les conditions qu'il convenait d'expliciter. Patrice Dubois, Serge Havé, Manuel Carvalho, Pascal Sergent, Patrick Gash. All are young military cadets. All were hitchhiking. And since January of 1980, they've all disappeared. Four of the five were stationed at the military base in Mourmelon. The fifth was at the nearby base in Maïl-le-Camp. Except for Olivier Donner, none of those who have gone missing have been found. There are no bodies, no evidence of a crime. The cadets are all part of France's compulsory military service. At the time, every 18-year-old French man had to serve 12 months in the military. Most upper-class teenagers find a way out. But lower-class young men found themselves in bases like Mourmelon. The army was pathetic from beginning to end. They didn't want to hear about disappearances. They called the men deserters. They never spoke with the families. The army dismissed them completely. The army treated the families badly. It treated the justice system badly. Because these men were poor and from every corner of France, they didn't have the resources to make themselves heard. One other young man also disappears near Mourmelon, a young rocket enthusiast who is heading to the base for a demonstration. Patrice Denis disappeared in 1985. He wasn't in the military, and his family is not letting his disappearance be ignored. 
Moi, j'ai passé une semaine sur place à faire week, des, des recherches, à me battu avec des amis. Friends, et c'est en interviewant des gens, en posant des questions qu'on nous a dit, vous savez, il y a des disparitions par ici, des the disparitions par ici. Donc là, ça a commencé so à nous inquiéter très sérieusement. Et alors, on m'a commencé à écrire à tous les gens, le ministre de l'Intérieur, le ministre de la Défense, parce qu'il était tellement près de la base de Mormolon. Et, et c'est là began. que le parcours du combattant commence. To the relief of the families, Vaillant pursues his theory that a serial killer is at work. He asks French psychiatrist Jean-Luc Ploy to piece together a profile of who the killer might be. Une hypothèse de travail, bien sûr. The theory was that this man was a military man and still in the service. That he had lots of frustration either before or during his career, and he was taking out this frustration through these violent acts. De cette nature-là. Jim Wright, who would eventually be drawn into the investigation, is a profiling expert who worked with the FBI. Serial killers are, are driven by fantasy, and there's really no limit to what a person's fantasy can be. And if they fantasize uh, uh, about a certain type of person, that may be the type of person that they're going to target if they have access to them. All of the victims disappeared on Thursday or Friday night, several on the same road. The families and the media begin calling this area the Triangle of Death. Un tueur en série, euh, j'allais dire, c'est un prédateur. A serial killer is il part à la chasse. He's going Donc il a, il a ses armes, he has il a ses endroits. Hein, tous les chasseurs ont des endroits. Ils prey. savent très bien qu'à ce moment-là, ils vont trouver une proie. Like Patrice Denis, Trevor O'Keefe was not in the military, but he has a similar build and is a similar age to all the cadets who disappear. He also vanishes near one of the bases. Trevor O'Keefe is added to the list of victims. So guys, we're going to concentrate our research around Bourmelon. It's right there, okay? What we know is that apparently the victims disappeared on the same road. Which is that one the gendarmes the begin looking for suspects station, who fit the early profile station, they've assembled. With such a strong link to local military bases, Vaillant begins his search there. More than 2,000 people near the base at Mormelon are questioned. Hitchhikers are sought out too. The profile suggests that the killer is sexually attracted to his victims, that he is choosing them based on their looks, but the only bodies that have been found, Donner and O'Keefe, show no signs of sexual assault. What is sexually gratifying to a serial killer is not defined the way you and I as normal people would, would define sexual gratification and sexual pleasure. One strong driving force of, of a serial killer is, is a need to, to exercise control over people. And when you think about it, the ultimate control that you have over somebody is the control over whether they live or die. Then, in December 1987, evidence points the investigation in quite a different direction. Things began moving, began moving very quickly when they found Trevor O'Keefe's knapsack in the area around Lake Dur. It's not far from Mormolon, and that knapsack is a link, a strong link between O'Keefe and the other young men who had disappeared. And when you look at the young Irishman's physique, you realize how much he resembles a military cadet. Police show pictures of O'Keefe to people in towns nearby. Was O'Keefe driven through these towns on the last day of his life? Police investigate Jean-Pierre McNabb, a local man who had recently separated from his wife. One of the theories we worked on was to confirm the story of a woman who told us her husband had left the marital home for Pauline. We knew that Trevor O'Keefe was in Pauline. With both of them there in early August, we had to check to see if the two had crossed paths. If, effectively, at a certain moment, they could have met. Before he left his house, McNabb had threatened his wife. When the gendarme tracked him down, a cord was found in his car that he could not explain. Blood is also found on McNabb's shirt, blood that is the same type as that of Trevor O'Keefe. McNabb is not in the military and there's no history of sexual violence. He certainly doesn't fit the profile the psychiatrists have put together. 
It leads to a new theory. Perhaps McNabb, angry and desperate over the failure of his relationship, snapped. Perhaps O'Keefe was the victim of a random act of fury and not part of a serial killer's deadly rampage. But the theory doesn't hold up for long. McNabb is eventually cleared. An innocent explanation is found for the blood on his shirt. The investigation stalls. Then, by the side of a highway, a young hitchhiker accepts a ride. It will be the most terrifying trip of his life. August 9, 1988. It's been a year since the discovery of Trevor O'Keefe's body. There are no new leads. Just dread that the killer will strike again. But in the town of Macon, gendarme André Genet is about to make a discovery that will blow the case wide open. Donc au cours de l'après-midi, j'étais avec un jeune gendarme. That day I was with a young gendarme, surveillant général. Just on a regular patrol. En passant, j'ai repéré un and at one point I saw a camper there, à, and à I said to the young guy, let's see what's going on. on. At that time of day, and that stretch of road, a camper van just seemed strange. Good evening, officers. Good evening, sir. May I see your papers, please? I'm in the family as well. I'm military too. Your papers? Yes. Yes, certainly, yes. <coughs> your name? Uh, Senat Pierre. Date of birth? 18th November 1946, Profession? Agent chef in Fontainebleau. Driver's license, please. Quand j'ai vu qu'il y avait une personne là, j'ai pu se penser à des gens qui venaient de faire un casque ou quelque chose et qui étaient là, qui s'étaient mis à couvert. Qu'est-ce qu'il y a Qui est ce homme Qu'est-ce qu'il y a de la maison C'est juste un hitchhiker que j'ai pris. Je veux dire, il était endormi. Qu'est-ce qu'il y a de la maison Il était endormi, c'est OK. Qu'est-ce qu'il y a Je peux venir. Je vais le faire maintenant. The hitchhiker is Palash Falbe, a young Hungarian who is touring northern France. Listen, we're both military. I, I was just having sex with him. I mean, uh... And he's terrified. Help me. He's trying to kill me. Help. Chef! Chef! I was in the van. Pierre Chanel Horrible. insists that this is nothing Help. more than a lover's Help. tryst. Help me. No, he, he said he was okay. He agreed, really. Chanel says he and Falve are both gay and enjoy rough sex. The gendarmes have caught them at an awkward moment. Help me. Falve chokes out a very different Help. story. He says he was picked up by Chanel on the side of the road. Chanel overpowered him and tied him up. He says he is convinced that Chanel is going to kill him. No, it's, it's okay. It was, uh, we were just playing. The gendarmes said, aren't taking chances. Everybody back to the station. When I took his military card in my hand, so when I had a look at his ID, I realized that he'd been in Romania. And the dates were Marmelon. the same as when the young en men plus, disappeared. Ce passé, and with what Falgo said, I decided to take everyone back to the station. We brought everyone to the unit. Chanel is a career member of the French military. He has seen combat in Lebanon and has received four medals for bravery and service. Fellow soldiers describe him as a warrior, an incredibly fit man of steel. He should have been an officer. All of his evaluations would lead you to believe he should be an officer. That was the career path he was on. The gendarme who arrests Chanel immediately call Captain Joël Vaillant. The fact that Falve was a hitchhiker and was bound is too similar to the O'Keefe case to be ignored. Vaillant sends his second-in-command, Jean-Marie Tarbes, to investigate. 
La première audition a duré de, de, de 3h du matin à 6h. J'ai ressenti qu'il y avait, qu'il y avait quelque chose. Il y avait quelque chose. C'était, c'était quelque chose d'assez intime, mais euh, suffisamment fort pour, euh, pour me décider effectivement à poursuivre. Alice. Oh, Alice. 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 I am Tarp from the Special Investigation Unit in Haas. I want to talk to you about the cadets in Montmelon. I have nothing to do with that. But you've heard about them, haven't you? It has nothing to do with me. I see. Let's talk about Montmelon. Yes, I was an instructor there, so... Je l'ai trouvé euh, relativement euh, sûr de lui et très rapidement sur la défensive en même temps. Ça part, ça part de, 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 de pas grand-chose, ça part d'une, d'une réponse trop hâtive ou d'une hésitation. Tout ça fait qu'on euh, se dit que la personne qui est en face de soi cache quelque chose. The interview continues till dawn. Whenever the conversation turns to Trevor O'Keefe or the missing cadets, Chanel denies any involvement but becomes defensive and angry. Tarb is deeply suspicious. J'ai immédiatement contacté le capitaine Marion, qui était à Saint-Denis. Je me souviens parfaitement avoir dit au capitaine celui-là, je le sens bien. dire qu'il fallait so effectivement continuer certaines investigations, faire, faire un, un curriculum vitae, un environnement de personnes. The first thing police do is to closely examine Chanel's camper van. For two days, forensic experts comb the vehicle for any clues that might tie Chanel to the death of Trevor O'Keefe or the missing military cadets. In 1988, forensic science is still gaining acceptance in France, but Loïc Le Ribot is a believer. He runs the top private forensics lab in the country. Bien sûr, je n'avais aucune idée de ce que je cherchais. Euh, I didn't know what I was looking for. C'est toujours Going beaucoup through de travail. a car is a lot of work. This camper van was even worse. Surchargé d'objets. Donc, la première approche. And it was absolutely full of de, stuff. De so the first thing we did was take everything out of it, the sheets and the blankets. Et les draps. Ensuite, j'ai fait une exploration au laser. Then I examined it with the laser to see if I could find blood or sperm. De liquide, de sang ou de sperme. Aspirer tout we l'intérieur. We vacuumed the entire interior. Puis à faire des prélèvements avec le tamponnoir. Et bien sûr, au fur et à mesure. And of course, everything we took was put under seal. All the evidence was put in plastic bags, which we sealed with red wax, and had a tag describing the contents. Une fiche indiquant le type d'objet qui était scellé. There is other, more obvious evidence. Several vibrators are found, an artificial vagina. In all, 70 separate items are taken into evidence, including ropes, chains, straps, and 32 pairs of men's underwear. Je me souviens qu'avoir trouvé un grand nombre de I remember that we found a lot of underwear. And one pair in particular was English. It had a Marks and Spencer's label. And it was too small. Il était caractérisé par le fait qu'il était d'une taille inférieure au slip qu'utilisait Chanel. The underwear leads to the latest theory. that Trevor O'Keefe was killed by Chanel. And the Irish teenager wasn't the only one. Chanel is forced to watch as the search of his van continues. A large foam mattress is removed from the back of the van. The mattress is filthy, covered with air. The sheets are soiled with semen. C'était en fait euh, la, really la, la résidence secondaire de Pierre Chanal. Son combi, en fait, il, il vivait dedans et c'était, c'était la pièce maîtresse euh, euh, à investiguer. Chanal continue à déclarer son innocence. 
Somewhere in the items collected from his van is the forensic evidence that will help clear his name or seal his fate. It's been a year since the body of Trevor O'Keefe was found in a farmer's field in northern France. The hunt for his killer has led investigators to the cramped room of a military trainer. Gendarmes search Pierre Chanel's barracks for proof that might connect him to O'Keefe's murder and that of several other young men. The room is spare, unadorned. It lacks even the most basic personal touch. He was isolated, alone, a man who has no personal life. One feels like this was a man who wanted no contact with others. He was completely solitary, without question. And in the context of the army, this was unusual. Sophisticated video equipment is found. Chef, look. Camera. Photo. Along with some pornographic videos. Chef. En 1985, j'ai indiqué au capitaine Vaillant. In the original profile, which I assembled in 1985, I told Captain Vaillant that this killer would be gay and in the military, a career member who was looking for victims he could find easily. Qui pouvait trouver très très facilement, j'allais dire, dans son dans son régiment. One of the home movies taken from Chanel's apartment shows soldiers on maneuvers. Chanel says he shot the footage in Verdun during the first week of August. It proves he could not have killed Trevor O'Keefe. But police discover that the soldiers in the video are from a battalion that didn't go to Verdun until the 10th of August. When confronted with the lie, Chanel changes his story and says he was at his base in Fontainebleau when O'Keefe was killed. An empty checkbook found in Chanel's apartment cast doubts on that story too. March 17, 1989. It's been half a year since the arrest of Pierre Chanel in the Palache Falbe case. Captain Joël Vaillant and Jean-Marie Tarbe have been carefully poring over the evidence that would tie him to the other cases. While the investigation was continuing, we began to prepare our interrogation of Chanel. We prepared 611 questions for his interrogation. We divided them into subjects, but then we mixed them up. We wanted to see if he would be able to keep his story straight. To see if Chanel would be stable in his answers. It was time to confront Chanel about the triangle of death. There have been a number of disappearances in Mourmelon area between 1980 and 1987. August the 7th and the 20th, 1981. September the 30th, 1982. It's impossible to say where I was on those dates. August the 23rd, 1985. It's impossible to say where I was on those dates. April, the 20th, 1987. It's impossible to say where I was on those precise dates. Listen, Chanel. Here is your signature on documents showing that you were on base on those days. This is your signature, right, Mr. Chanel? Yes. Lorsqu'on posait des questions très précises, 
When we asked him very specific questions, when we backed him into a corner, his facial tics acted up. He began to get very angry, threw himself down on the floor. Then he would shut down completely. Blocage. One shouldn't be really surprised when sitting down and talking to these people to see a mixture of emotions because it, and it may not relate so much to what's being said in the interview as it is to what's going on in their own minds. And those emotions are going to, are going to seep out. Bayon plays one of the homemade videotapes discovered during the raid of Chanel's apartment. Et où je passe une cassette vidéo I put this tape in, and on it, Chanel is exposing himself. Right away, the ticks began, and the sniffing, and he has this extraordinary reaction. You made this tape, didn't you? Ah, with bands of music playing in the background? Hey, it's quite something, huh? You calm down and keep quiet, okay? We had to restrain him, and after that, he refused to talk. I kept talking to him, but it was a monologue. A faire un monologue. Monsieur Chanel, Agent Jeff. We are brothers in the military, right? So just call me. Et je lui faire comprendre que. So I said that the person who did these things couldn't keep it to themselves forever. No one could keep such terrible secrets. And such a person would need help. This person wasn't a criminal, they were sick. Let me help you. I felt he was very receptive. Disgusting. At 23h30, we arrive at the at 11.30 that night, we get back to the holding cell, and he's confused, dazed. He came back towards me. He didn't know where he was. And at that moment, there was something, an understanding. But according to French law, I could not question him further. I could have. I am sure I could have gotten him to talk. October 23rd, 1990. Pierre Chanel has been in custody for a year and a half. Finally, he comes to trial for the kidnapping of the Hungarian hitchhiker, Palash Falbe. Armed with a damning videotape that Chanel took of himself with Falve and the testimony of the young hitchhiker, Chanel is sentenced to 10 years in jail. Joël Vaillant has failed to get his confession, but he's confident he can build his case with Chanel behind bars. Quand Pierre Chanel était mis en examen, when Chanel was tried for the crimes against Falve, on s'est dit, on a told un peu we had the time to dig into this, to really find the proof we needed. Material, des preuves concrètes de sa participation ou non. The concrete proof that he was also involved in the other crimes. Il était impliqué. Quand il a inculpé pour l'affaire Falvey, when he was charged with Falvey, it was as clear as the nose on your face. He was guilty of everything. The families were impatient to have him charged for the disappearances of their children. In fact, an already troubled story was just about to get much worse. June 19th, 1995, Pierre Chanel walks out of prison a free man. He has been a model prisoner. With time off for good behavior, he has served just five years of a 10-year sentence for kidnapping and assault. While Chanel is in prison, Little progress is made on any of the evidence gathered from his van. Procedural delays and legal wrangling have stalled the investigation. The man some suspect of being a brutal serial killer responsible for the deaths of at least eight young men faces no new charges. We just didn't have all the evidence together. We were still talking to experts. And the opinion, public opinion, was turning against us. We were attacked for being too slow. 
The families of the men who have disappeared throughout northern France are appalled. C'est for my pour parents, parents en tout cas, it was a scandal, le, le scandal, a complete injustice. injustice total. We felt let down by the system again. Judge Charles Marion sat at a table very near to me and he promised me, he said he promised he would not release Chanel. He said Chanel will do 10 years in prison, but he didn't. Chanel is out of jail, but watched carefully. Under intense pressure, Chanel maintains his innocence. He calls a local radio station to plead his case. In spite of my innocence, I know that I'll be found guilty. And if that happens, I'll end my life. I think he tried to turn the tables, reverse the room, the families were the aggressors, and he held himself up as a victim. He wanted it to seem as if the entire system had turned against him. With pressure from the families growing, a new judge is appointed to the Chanel case, Pascal Chapard. His main focus, the forensic evidence gathered from Chanel's van. For years, it has been stored in a dusty attic. The new judge demands that it all get sent to him. Pascal Chapard, for me, uh... Pascal Chopin, for me, c'est quelqu'un que, que j'admire. Quite apart from the fact that he became a very good friend, permis, cas, he's the man who reopened this case. De relancer le dossier. We went to see Shepard on his own, and he said, "I will not leave this case until it moves. I promise you," he said, "I won't leave." In spite of his determination, progress is slow. The crimes occurred in several different jurisdictions. Jean-Marie Tarb re-examines the evidence taken from Chanel's van. He finds several hundred pieces of hair and other evidence that had been collected, but never analyzed. Jean-Paul Moissin is called in to examine the new evidence. Les échantillons qui nous ont été envoyés correspondaient tous à des the cheveux ou sent poils, to us were hair and skin found in his van. We examined 457 hairs. Donc on a analysé 457 cheveux exactement. Nous avons trouvé pour We found some of those belong to Chanel. Three kinds of mitochondrial DNA. Et également, on a trouvé trois motifs d'ADN mitochondrial qui correspondent à trois des victimes. It corresponded to three of the victims: Gash, Denis, et Balak Falvaille. Donc la probabilité de trouver quelqu'un d'autre avec le même motif dans la population générale est de l'ordre de 0,06%. The possibility of this match with somebody in the general population is 0.06%, which is rare, but not out of the question. But remember, we found three different sets of DNA from three different victims. In a vehicle, we suspect they had been picked up in. Suspecté d'avoir transporté ces personnes. What might be another key piece of forensic evidence has gone missing. Lot 19 has disappeared. Le fameux scellé numéro the famous lot 19 was the one which contained a sample of earth which came from the shovel la, la we found in Chanel's van. And as the case was so important, I kept my own sample, saying to myself, this is significant. Le Ribot's sample from the blade of the shovel is compared with the dirt found at the shallow grave of Trevor O'Keefe. Tiny crystals in the dirt are unique to the region and are identical in both samples. I know that the shovel in Chanel's van was used to dig the grave. I'm not saying who was holding it, but I am saying that this is the shovel that was used to bury Trevor O'Keefe. Police Captain Joël Vaillant wants more. To build his case, Vaillant consults an American expert. Je me suis rendu à Quantico, I went to Quantico, FBI, FBI nous avons été reçus par Jim Wright, Wright pour Wright nous donner les conclusions opinion. de ses travaux. When they came over, uh, I didn't speak French and they didn't speak English. Uh, we had a translator, but there was some times where we didn't need a translator because we really knew what we were saying because uh, of that common language and the camaraderie and the brotherhood. Il nous a dit que, effectivement, From nous the information étions face we gave him, he confirmed that we were up against a serial killer. Ne this type of person will only stop façons. in two ways. They are arrested or they will kill themselves. The gendarmes feel that they're closing in. It will take several more years, but the case of Pierre Chanel does finally make it to court. 
October 14, 2003, 16 years after the body of Trevor O'Keefe was found in a shallow grave, the trial of Pierre Chanel finally begins. But Chanel is not there to hear the charges against him. He is too weak to attend the trial. A suicide attempt has landed him in hospital. And for the last three months, he has refused to eat. The trial will take place, even though Chanel is sent to hospital in Reims because he was on a hunger strike. I saw him the day before the trial began. He looked like a skeleton. His physical state was precarious, but his mental state was fine. He was determined. From the moment I became his lawyer, he said he had already been tried and convicted, and he vowed he would never go to trial. Si le procès doit avoir lieu, il était condamné d'avance et qu'il n'affronterait pas ce procès. The case of Pierre Chanel is about to take its final shocking turn. Pierre Chanel is on trial for the murder of Trevor O'Keefe and the disappearance of two other young men. The case rests on three slender pieces of hair and a pile of dirt. It's not a lot, but it's the best shot at putting a suspected serial killer behind bars. La première après-midi que le procès s'ouvre, Chanel refuse the first afternoon of the trial, Chanel refuses to be there. His lawyer was there. The trial goes forward. And for us, it was almost a miracle. We didn't think the trial would take place. And the evening after the first day, we were euphoric. Finally, finally, we would have him in front of us. And we had heard that he had started to eat again. For us, a page had turned. This was a new chapter. Nous rentrons dans le vif du sujet. The euphoria is short-lived. The very night his trial begins, Chanel makes good on his defiant threat. He hides the blade from a disposable razor in the tape of his IV tube. He uses it to slice into his right thigh. He severs his femoral artery. Silently, alone in his hospital bed, Pierre Chanel bleeds to death. Frisson. I shivered. I said, you mean he's really dead? And then I realized that everything was gone. Everything had melted away. We had done all of this for nothing. Chanel had won. But we felt cheated of justice. We were robbed of justice. Chanel should be in prison. He shouldn't be dead. All the families wanted to know what had happened to their children. So our first reaction was, they'll never know. And then, we were angry. It was a tragic end for him, but it was even more so for the families. The death of Pierre Chanel ends the string of disappearances that had haunted northern France. The publicity of the trial also forces military officials to take one last look at their records. In 2004, the names of two other recruits who have disappeared turn up. Both Michel Giannini and Aldo Tachin vanished in the late 1970s. Both of them were based in Valdo, another camp where Chanel was an instructor. The man who stared Chanel in the face believes there are even more bodies. J'ai toujours en l'esprit. In the back of my mind, I know there are more victims, other hitchhikers who have disappeared. Qui n'ont pas été élucidés. We may never know. Peut avoir une corrélation avec les autres disparitions. The families who fought for so long to get their story heard do finally win an important victory. Until 2002, the French military still considered the men deserters. But in 2005, it relents, and in court, the families win a landmark settlement. 
Le tribunal de grande instance de Paris a rendu un jugement extrêmement courageux qui, véritablement, pour nous les avocats, a réhabilité la justice. Le tribunal a reconnu l'ensemble des fautes graves qui ont été commises par la justice d'un bout à l'autre de l'affaire. Le tribunal a accueilli et reconnu toutes les personnes que nous représentons comme étant des victimes non seulement de Pierre Chanel, mais aussi, entre parenthèses, qui n'était pas dit, mais de la justice. The families of the missing men receive money and recognition, but after so many years, bitterness remains. Bon alors c'est une satisfaction parce que c'est la première fois en gros qu'on reconnaît que les victimes ont été maltraitées dans cette affaire. Mais c'est aussi le doute que cette décision ne serve qu'à faire en sorte que les victimes ne soient pas enterrées. Mais c'est aussi le doute que cette décision ne serve qu'à faire en sorte que les victimes ne soient pas enterrées. Mais c'est aussi le doute que cette décision ne serve qu'à faire en sorte que les victimes ne soient pas enterrées. The crimes of Pierre Chanel die with him. The truth is buried forever. The families, already missing sons and brothers, will never have the answers they need. Mm -hmm.